Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final episode in our first season of Canada Files. I'm Jim Deeks, and as you can see, I'm here at home, as I'm sure all of you can understand, because of social distancing in these extraordinary times of the spring of 2020. This is not the final episode we had planned in our interview series, but unfortunately, virus precautions overtook our production schedule and made our last guests unavailable. So we've decided to end our season by, you'll pardon the expression, isolating a few highlights from our previous 12 discussions. Our very first episode in the series featured a lively and interesting chat with Canada's most celebrated novelist, Margaret Atwood, author of The Handmaid's Tale and The Testaments. People had warned me that Ms. Atwood could be somewhat intimidating, but my crew and I found her very charming and very amusing. Tell us how you do it, how you go about it. Do you sit down and, I know you handwrite a lot and you type a lot, but do you sit down and type away madly for hours and force yourself to stop? Or do you sit down and say 500 words a day, no more, no less, every day uh, until this book is done? More like that. Interesting. Um, but, but of course, it's very erratic. You know, some days you write quite a lot, and other days you don't. And um, do you know what a rolling barrage is? It's do tell. It's a military term. <laughs> Okay, so we have you, time. Yeah, we have time. Yeah. Okay, so so you're supposed to, if you're, it's what they did at Vimy Ridge, one of the famous World War One battles, which was a Canadian battle, and after Vimy Ridge, they never lost one. In fact, so successful were they perceived as being that they were in trench coat ads. The Canadian says, "This is the trench coat I prefer." <laughs> this really happened. Okay. Um, okay, so you're supposed to run forward to a count duck down and the artillery shoots over your heads. If you get it wrong, it hits you. Okay, so the writing and the typing for me usually goes like that. So the handwriting is the running forward and then there's a pause while the typing catches up to it. Okay, and then you go forward with the handwriting, you, the cat, typing catches up. But while I'm typing from my otherwise illegible handwriting and there are moments when I think, what is that word? <laughs> uh, well, when, I gather your spelling that, is not that writing. good, so you may it's, be stumped. It's not the spelling, it's the handwriting. Okay. Yeah, spelling is not an obstacle for me. I'm like a lot of writers, I spell by ear. Uh, but, but other people can fix that. My, my mother said rather caustically when I was, said I was going to be a writer, she said, well, if you're going to be a writer, you'll need to learn to spell. And I said, others will do that for me. And they have. Most of our Canadian viewers would still recognize the face of Peter Mansbridge, who spent 29 years as the primary anchor of the CBC National News. Peter was also the host of a long standing interview program called Mansbridge One on One, in which he chatted with a wide variety of world leaders and famous people, some of whom were surprisingly cantankerous. Was there ever an interview subject that you, you just didn't like or you didn't respect and you really had to bite your tongue from saying something that you would have liked to have said? You mean Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> she was tough. I interviewed her three times. Uh, the first two times when she was Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain and it was all fun. Then after she got, after she, uh, kind of booted out of that position. She wrote a book, The Downing Street Years, and she was on a book tour, right? So she ended up in Canada and I, I got the interview and uh, it was brutal. Wow. It was just like, she kept accusing me of not having read the book, which is, a, which is a, an easy claim to make if you're an author because most people do the, haven't read the book. Either their researchers read the book or they've read the book cover, or they've read a review, and they go from there, um, which is not a criticism, it's just time. Uh, I, had, in fact, had read her book, uh, because I was fascinated, especially in the 
Falklands War and trying to understand the leadership role that a prime minister has, especially in Britain given its history of a wartime prime minister. And so my questions were generated around that, but she kept accusing me, pointing at me, you've never read the book, you haven't read the book, and I go, and I've read the book. Anyway, it was a disastrous interview, and uh, so I was frustrated uh, by it and, you know, have kicked myself in the years since that I didn't say, in fact, I read the book. Yeah. Did you write it? Because she hadn't. Very close. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't, and I should have, and I, I you well, know, I'll forever that was... uh, regret it. One of the most inspirational guests on our first season was former astronaut Chris Hadfield, who did three missions in space, including commanding the International Space Station, walking in space, and singing and playing his guitar in space. From the age of nine, Chris wanted to be an astronaut. Jim, it started, I think, in my mind. I, I, was, I was growing up on a farm, primarily, so I wasn't surrounded by all the opportunity and stimulation of a city, but what I had was books and, and comic books and science fiction books, sort of the, 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 to go beyond the horizons of where I lived. And then Star Trek came on television, and that was, I mean, it wasn't Bonanza. This was, this was a Western, but it was in space, and Kirk and Spock and all those characters. And then 2001, A Space Odyssey came out, and that was just, I went to their, a friend of mine's birthday party and that combination of huge opportunity through imagination really got me fired up but at the same time as the firemen and the hockey players were, were stimulating young Canadian kids people were starting to fly in space for real yeah. and it wasn't just fantasy but even then how realistic was it to think that maybe one day I, a little Canadian boy here just outside of Sarnia, Ontario, could actually be an astronaut. Uh, it, was, it wasn't unrealistic. It was impossible. Yeah. Because uh, we didn't have astronauts, right? We didn't have a space agency. Canada didn't have rocket ships. We didn't have capsules. We had none of that. But uh, you didn't have to take a very big leap to realize that space flight just a few years previous had been impossible for everybody. When I was born, nobody had, when you were born, no one had ever flown in space. You know, I was two years old when Gagarin and, and Al Shepard flew. So space flight was still brand new. So that made it seem, even though right now, by definition, it wasn't something a little Canadian kid could actually do. I thought, well, not very long ago, those guys, Neil Armstrong couldn't do that either. So I, I can't predict the future, but I really thought maybe I could work on myself. And that's why I and my brothers joined the Air Cadets to, to try and get that first step away from the world, start to fly and see just uh, how high the future could take us. Before the coronavirus overtook our lives quite suddenly in February, probably the biggest overriding news story of the last decade has been climate change and the steadily growing effects on our planet. Canadian scientist and broadcaster Dr. David Suzuki has been warning about climate change for years. And now he's even more concerned about what's ahead, especially for his own grandchildren. We're at that point. Yeah. We're over the edge of the cliff. But that doesn't mean it's too late. It makes a big difference whether you fall 500 feet or 50 feet. And I'm going to do everything I can to try to make it a 50-foot drop and not a 500-foot drop. But we're over the edge of the cliff. Are you ever going to retire? My wife has finally convinced me that retirement is not a word that means anything. Uh, I believe passionately in what I'm doing. It's no longer about uh, celebrity or power or, or money. It's about my grandchildren. My youngest grandchildren are now two years old. They're twins. And uh, when my youngest daughter was uh, pregnant and found out she had twins, she and her husband and their child moved upstairs and lived with us for two years. They had the babies and then we helped care for them. When the babies were about five months old, they, I was holding them. I mean, they were the joy of my life. I'm a twin myself. And uh, I don't know what happened, but suddenly I just began to cry. And my wife and my daughter grabbed the babies and they're going, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I just started to wail. 
and I was out of control because I realized those kids don't have a chance. I mean, the things that I say I believe, the science tells us, they don't have a chance. And it's, it's a terrifying, it's a terrifying thing that, but all I can do now is ensure that whatever I can do to make their life worthwhile, they're here now, they're the joy of my life, and work to try to, uh, try to minimize the impact of what's coming, that's, that's all. That was an emotional moment on Canada Files. But we also found some humor, especially in our discussion with Rick Mercer, who spent over 25 years as a regular satirist and observer of life on a series of national network television shows. For a few years, one of Rick's regular segments was to interview Americans about Canadians. It was a wildly popular segment. Uh, it was made out of desperation. I was on, 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 the, on location in Washington, D.C. one day, and it just kind of happened. I was it, doing streeters on the street, and I started talking about a prime minister that didn't exist and a summit that didn't exist, and people were so polite, they just went with it. And it was a very funny segment. And it was the original kind of Canadian U.S. joke when the Americans show up at the border in July saying, where's the ski hill? Right. It's the original joke. And I just kept doing that joke over and over again. The first time the segment aired, and it was obvious that it, it had really struck a nerve, my father called me and said, I saw that. Promise me you'll never do that ever again. He thought it was terrible, terrible taste. Um, but it was all in well, good fun. It really was. And ultimately, Canadians understand. We know everything about the United States because we get the American channels, we get the American pop music, we get the American... It's a behemoth. Of course we know everything. And likewise, Americans don't know anything about Canada because we're tiny compared to them. Not physically, but just in terms of population. When, when Ted Koppel did a piece on talking to Americans and Good Morning America, and they all did the same thing. They all sent crews to Canada to do talking to Canadians to turn the tables. But they went out on the streets of Toronto and they were like, so the President of the United States, John Wayne, is visiting Ottawa this week. And everyone went, "That's no, the President of the United States is not John Wayne, and if the President was here, we would know about it. And they're like, wow, they know everything about us. Many Canadian hockey fans vividly remember the Olympic gold medal victories of the Canadian women's hockey team in 2002 and 2006. These two tournaments really put women's hockey on the map, in part because of the intense rivalry between the Canadian and American women's teams. The captain of those Canadian teams was the very talented and articulate Cassie Campbell. How deep did that distaste for each other go? Was it just on the ice or was it also out of the arena as well? Oh no, we didn't like each other at all. And we didn't know each other. We had no idea who each other really were because we didn't play together. We didn't play against each other during the regular season. Um, so you had no desire to like them either. And it was such a huge rivalry. It was so physical. I mean, if you wanted a gold medal, you knew that was the team you really had to go through. And, um, you know, but I look back now and I think to myself, how could we not have had more respect for one another? Because we were literally wearing the same shoes, you know, trying to grow the game and just doing it in different countries. But uh, there was a, it was hatred, it, you know, and I, I hate to use that word, <laughs> but it, it really was a hatred. It really was a lack of respect. It really was, um, you know, you didn't care to know them and you were willing to do whatever it was going to take to beat them. Does that linger today or are you now friends off the ice with some of the players you faced? I, I'm definitely friends with some of them. You know, some of them have gotten into broadcasting so we run into each other at the rinks and, you know, Cami Granado's a great friend and someone who I admire and, and yet her and I would have never really even spoken to each other back in the day. And, um, you know, I, I do. I, I have a genuine respect for all of them and what they've done. And, um, what they did for the game in the United States. And, you know, it's still bitter, though, for them to, you know, go into the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame, the 98 Olympic team, and you see it on Twitter, and you're like, okay, well, congratulations, you guys. But, um, you know, you, 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 you're still bitter about the loss and, and the emotions that come with that loss. But I think 
the respect and the admiration for what they've done for the game and the friendships that developed over the years are they're so important and they're so valuable to me. Another very distinguished Canadian is the recently retired Chief Justice of the Canadian Supreme Court, the Honorable Beverly McLaughlin. We sat down with Justice McLaughlin inside the Supreme Court chamber and among other things, discuss the differences between the top courts in the Canadian and U.S. systems. I think most people would have the perspective that the U.S. Supreme Court is more politicized mm -hmm. than the Canadian Supreme Court. Yes. And perhaps we saw that clearly with the approval process that Brett Kavanaugh went through in the U.S. in 2018. But here in Canada, is there any political influence or do justices, once they're appointed, feel any degree of loyalty or fealty to the prime minister who appointed them? No, uh, I think that uh, the uh, courts in Canada and the Supreme Court in particular uh, prize their independence and you can't identify a particular judge as being a protege of this party or that party or that polit this political view and that political view and it's uh, much more difficult to predict how they will uh, vote on particular matters. Now I do believe in fairness that the Supreme Court of the United States justices prize their judicial independence too but we do know that there's been a polarization of legal philosophy and legal views on certain issues in the United States and there is a sense in the public that uh, conservative justices will or should vote in a conservative way on certain issues and vice versa. For Is that justifiable? Do, do you appreciate or admire that system Not if it's more political yeah. than ours? No, I, I, I admire the institution of Supreme Court of the United States, which, which is a venerable institution and has contributed so much to the legal culture of the world. But personally, and I say this with great respect, uh, I, I do not think it's a, a salutary thing uh, for a court to be seen, uh, or to be certainly, uh, more politicized. Whether or not you were a teenager in the late 1960s, as I was, you're probably very familiar with the legendary rock group known simply as The Band. Robbie Robertson from Toronto was the band's lead guitarist and songwriter. And given the opportunity to meet up with him, we traveled to Los Angeles to sit down with Robbie and discuss his musical beginnings. Because when I was 16 years old, I went from Canada down to the Mississippi Delta. And at the time, in the beginning of rock and roll and everything, that was like the holy land of music down there. That's where it seemed like everybody came from. And I was extremely curious about how can this area, how can this part of the world, how can it give birth to so much music, so much great stuff, and, and, and be something that I want to be a part of? I want to, I want to bring my Canadianism into that world. So when I got down there, I was excited and, and full of ambition, but I soon realized that I was too inexperienced, too young, not a good enough guitar player yet, and I was from Canada. There's no Canadians in Southern rock and roll bands. That's illegal. I had to rise to an occasion here. And growing up in Canada, <clears throat> we have a bit of a like, we're from too far away. We're not from the center of where everything is happening. So it means we have to work harder, try harder, and bring some talent to the table. It was very courageous. As you mentioned, you were 16 years old and you took a train by yourself all the way down there. I mean, looking back, you actually quit school and uh, left home at that age. Are you amazed that you 
had the guts to do that then and also that your mother let you go? That was a bit of a tough sell <clears throat> to my mother. and But that thing of if I don't find out, if I don't try, if I don't show up, I'll be sorry the rest of my life. Another Canadian who's lived a long time in the United States is Suzanne Craig, a distinguished investigative reporter for the New York Times. Suzanne and two colleagues won the coveted Pulitzer Prize for excellence in journalism last year for a report which alleged that Donald Trump built his fortune largely through tax fraud. I asked Suzanne about the official reaction to that report. I have to say, there, there were a lot of people who we knew would be unhappy. In addition, we had a lot of confidential records that were involved in the story that ran, that won the Pulitzer. There was bank records and tax records. So we, we had a lot of discussions about it throughout, but ultimately we felt, and, and I guess part of it is just spending so much time with the material that we had that produced the story, we felt very confident when we went to press with the story, you know, we accused, and it was the first time the New York Times had ever done that, a sitting president of tax fraud. We felt really comfortable about that accusation and that we had the goods because we knew the material so well and we had spent so much time reporting it out that we felt confident about it. So on the one hand, you know, I think we were, there was, you know, talk and discussion throughout the way, but as we went along, I think we just became more and more comfortable with what we had. And were you ever looking over your shoulders to see if there were people <laughs> following you or did you get any threats? Well, I'm a bit paranoid by nature, so I'm always looking over <laughs> my shoulder. Um, but we, you know, we live in an interesting time in the United States right now as reporters. You know, I've been covering Trump now since not long after he announced his candidacy for president in 2016. And one thing I, I don't think you can ever get accustomed to is things like in our newsroom, we have to go through active shooter training now. Um, you know, you're sort of in a, in, a, in a world, when you have, you work in an office, you'd love to have a window seat. Well, now it's sort of a hazard at the New York Times because we're surrounded by other buildings where they have to do security checks to make sure there aren't people either A, looking in through the windows to see what's on our screens or people who may have guns. I mean, that stuff is now, a reality for reporters at the New York Times and I think that that's always on our mind in a way that's unfortunate because there's a pretty big cause and effect between that and the hate speech that the President of the United States spews about reporters. On just about every episode of Canada Files I would ask our guests what the words being Canadian meant to them. All of the answers were quite different and most were very good but I think these two summed it up most succinctly. I boil it down to Canadians are raised with a fundamental trust in authority. Americans are raised with a fundamental mistrust of authority. And I think that manifests itself a lot of different ways. It comes from having a different birth as a nation. The United States fought its way through revolution into becoming a country. Canada was granted over a 30-year period to, to become a nation. And so we reflect our own pasts. I would. I was born Canadian, I would rather be Canadian. It, 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 I, it suits me better, I like it better. But the United States, there's no country on earth that has opportunity like the United States. And they were the ones that gave me the opportunity to be the test pilot that I was and to have a chance to fly in space three times. So I'm, I'm eternally thankful to the cooperation between the two, but I'm fiercely proud of being a Canadian. And, and Proud of them. My, my great grandfather was a physical trainer for the Maple Leafs in the late 30s. And, and so, how, how can I not be a Maple Leafs fan? So, I've always been a Toronto yeah, yeah. Maple Leafs fan as well. We were ahead of our time in that we've always been very diverse. We've always had to recognize that in some way, not sufficiently to my mind, but we've, we've always had to do that. And uh, other countries are catching up. <laughs> Think of it that way. Good. So for a while we, we got disparaged because we didn't have sort of one big symbolic thing that people could point to and I remember the magazine Saturday Night running a contest uh, which was complete the sentence as Canadian as, as in, as American, as apple pie, etc. And the winner was as Canadian as possible under the circumstances. <laughs> So those are just some of the highlights from a dozen half-hour interviews on Canada Files. 
We hope you've enjoyed them. You know, the objective of our series has been to showcase some of the most interesting and successful people on our side of the border. And to remind all our viewers that we Canadians are America's best friends and most reliable partners in business and in life. And we're very grateful to all the guests who appeared on our series. You can see all of our interviews by visiting our website, canadafiles.ca, or our YouTube channel, which you can find by uploading YouTube and searching there for Canada Files. We hope that we can start producing a new season of Canada Files, but until then, stay safe, be kind to each other, and sincerely, thanks for watching. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of William E. Wilder, as well as the following donors, the John and Jocelyn Barford Family Foundation, Mary Alice Davis, in memory of Glenn W. Davis, John and Margaret Deeks, Wendy Deeks, in memory of Peter A. Deeks, Richard and Donna Ivey, Alice and Ted Kernahan, the Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, Andrew and Valerie Pringle, Eleanor and Francis Shen, the Sonner Foundation, the Browning Watt Foundation, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.